Welcome back to Dr. Hollowed. In today's video, we unravel spine tingling stories that defy explanation, as individuals share their scariest encounters with the paranormal. Join us on this journey into the unknown and don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the video. Back when I first started working in a new town, my best friend was studying at a university in the neighboring town. We would meet once a week in the cinema in her town for the sneak preview. One night after the film ended, we exchanged goodbyes, and I hurried to my car to drive home. As I left the parking lot, the idea struck me, wouldn't it be nice to take the country road home instead of the highway? I shook my head, puzzled about the origin of that thought. Opting for the country road would double my travel time, and I had an early work commitment the next morning. Despite this, I continued towards the highway. I had never felt scared while driving before or after that night, but I was nearly trembling with fear as I merged onto the highway. The road was relatively empty, and I eventually caught up to a truck. On a normal day, I would have overtaken it, but I couldn't bring myself to do so. Strangely, the presence of that truck felt like safety to me. Thoughts crossed my mind about the final thoughts of people struck by wrong-way drivers. Again, I had no clue where these thoughts originated. Just before reaching my exit, a wrong-way driver passed us by. To this day, I haven't found a logical reason for my fear that night. I wasn't listening to the radio, I had a CD playing. There was no music or radio in the cinema, and smartphones weren't around at that time. Somehow, something or someone seemed to have warned me. I was at a visitation a few years ago. I was in line at the casket. It was very crowded, and the line was long. All of a sudden, I felt the hairs on my arm stand on end, and I got goosebumps. When I looked up, there was this woman sitting on a bench across the room from me. She was staring at me and had a very stern look on her face. Her brown hair looked like she had slept on it and hadn't brushed it. She was very pale. I stared back at her for about 45 seconds to a minute. She never blinks. People kept walking in front of her, but once they moved, I could see that she was not taking her eyes off of me. It made me feel extremely uneasy. I remember my heart rate picking up. At some point, someone near me in line turned to talk to me. I took my eyes off her to respond. It was a very short conversation. No more than 30 seconds. When I looked back where she was sitting, she was gone. The uneasy feeling stayed with me until I left the funeral home. I scanned the area, looking for her. I never saw her again. I don't know if this was paranormal, but it freaked me out. I went to a graveyard at about midnight with a group of friends to visit an old friend who died in a car accident. While we were standing around his grave, telling good stories about him, I heard the faint voice of an elderly woman. One of my friends says out loud, O-S-H-T, W-T-F? I stand up and look toward the source. I saw a very old woman, literally dressed in a white, tattered nightgown, about 100 feet away. She started talking to us. Sir? Get over here now, I need help. We stood still. No one said a thing. The part that weirded me out was that she used the singular word sir when clearly there were five of us. She started walking closer and started speaking again, but even louder. Boys, I need your help now. Note the plurality. Then she literally started running toward us, screaming nonsense. We were all scared out of our minds, so we ran back to the car, with this old woman close behind. We reached the car, which was a two-door, and everyone got in before me. Including the driver, so the driver's seat was blocking my entrance to the back seat. I yelled as I approached the car, and he got out and let me in. Door slammed, and we flew down the small graveyard roads to the opposite side, where the exit was. This is where shit got weird. We get to the other side of the graveyard in, like, 10 seconds. We're speeding toward the exit, and we approach a curved road that was well lit. And the old lady ran onto the road. There is no way she ran over there that fast. I see her trying to chase us down, and finally she lets out the most terrifying scream I've ever heard. It sounded like she was being murdered slowly and painfully. We fled the scene just seconds later and never returned. Four other friends of mine can testify as witnesses to that night. This was by far the most terrifying experience of my life. I have two stories, one scary, one not so much. When I was young, six seven-ish, we moved into our first house. I had a very visceral nightmare about a man chasing me out of my home with a handheld sickle. At first, he resembled my father, and when I got out of the house, I turned around, and his face was different his skin pale as Michael Myers' mask from Halloween. Eventually I woke up and forgot the dream. Fast forward to about 9-10-ish in my age. 
I was home alone for summer break, and around 10 a.m. I felt a strong urge to get out of the house. At first, I thought there was an intruder, but there was no evidence to support or even suspect someone had broken in. The best way to describe it was that my fight or flight was triggered, and my brain was screaming and running. I ran out the back door into my back door neighbors, who had kids around my age but had a babysitter. The babysitter let me hang out until my dad came home, but I watched my house from afar, looking for any signs of activity, such as people in the windows. When my dad came home, I returned home, and I never told my dad out of embarrassment for being so afraid of nothing. Eventually, we moved to a new home when I was 13. The house dates back long ago, like pictures of the house surrounded by empty plots. We had an old stair closet that never stayed closed. No matter how many times we closed it, the next morning it would be open. No matter what, I never felt alone in the house. When I was asleep, I felt like I was being watched. One day, I come downstairs and start making a sandwich, unbeknownst to my parents. My father makes the comment, Jesus Christ, is Anon stomping up there? I made the comment that I was in the kitchen. My father and mother become spooked and grab a bat and a knife. They proceeded to check every room of the house for an intruder, but we never found one. These problems remained chronic so much that we just got used to them and jokingly dubbed the ghost Jim. Anytime we heard a weird noise, we told Jim to knock it off or tell Jim we weren't in the mood. Of course, the noises never stopped, it was more of a coping mechanism than anything. In high school, me and my friends started and ran a paranormal investigators club. We were lame, and it was mostly just an excuse to hang out. We did have a mild interest in ghosts, and our town or school had plenty of urban legends to go off of. We didn't get permission from the school to have activities outside of campus, and we couldn't go into any buildings that had urban legends surrounding them. So we were stuck outside of buildings on campus at night. So we had a bunch of outings where we took photos of random things and looked for orbs, there were a lot, but I was never like, OMG das a ghost. So one day, we got our hands on a tape recorder. We had ourselves a little seance. We formed a circle, said a generic greeting to any spiritual things that might be present, and included some instructions. We were going to leave the tape on for two minutes, and the group was going to be silent. This was a Friday night. After the tape, we packed it up and went home. Our next club meeting was the following Tuesday. So our teacher chaperone slash endorsement was a nice guy. But not anything special as far as teachers go. You know the type. So we sit down and start talking, and the teacher tells us that we should probably listen to the tape. So, we fire it up. Everything is going exactly as we remembered. Silence begins. About 45 seconds into the tape screeches, it makes a sound like it's speeding up. And then, in a low, gravelly voice, we hear. Get out. Tape screeches again resumes. The entire two minutes of silence were accounted for. I don't know what to make of the event, all I know is that I don't believe the tape was doctored. I don't think the teacher had the skills to do so. B, it was physical tape, not digital. And the recorder was probably older than I was or am. It might not have been a big deal to just go over and tape over the silence, but I don't think that accounts for the strange sounds the tape made. For several years, I experienced what is commonly called sleep paralysis. The first experience was one of the most terrifying. I was taking a nap on Christmas Day. I had the common experience of a visceral buzzing in my ear or head and a feeling of terrible evil coming upon me. I awoke, but I couldn't open my eyes or move a muscle. I then felt someone grab onto my feet and start crawling up my body. I felt completely overcome with evil. Finally, I pushed it all back, opened my eyes, and found myself alone. Similar experiences happened for years, each was terrifying but almost became commonplace. I discovered that it was sleep paralysis, and someone said the best way to deal with it was to give in to it and not to fight it. One day, while I was taking a nap on my bed in the basement, my brother was a couple rooms down in our entertainment room. I felt that familiar visceral buzzing, my eyes opened, but I couldn't move. I decided to let go this time, and I gave in to it. As soon as I had done that, my body started to sit up, I saw my arm rising, and one thought dominated my mind. I had to kill my brother. I was halfway up, and panic set in. I pushed back as hard as I could, and eventually I woke up panting and terrified. I never gave in to it again. It's lessened over the past few years, but every year or so, it will come back. When I was pregnant with my second son, I had a very vivid dream that my first son had died in his room. In my dream, I walked into his room and picked him up. I could feel how cold and heavy he was in my arms. I was screaming and screaming, trying to get help, but every time I ran through his bedroom door, I'd end up back in his room. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't wake up. 
I suddenly heard someone very clearly say, Mortis, he's fine. Wake up, and I opened my eyes to see an elderly man standing in my bedroom doorway. He nodded and walked away. I immediately jumped out of bed, still sobbing, and ran through my house, turning on lights, looking for this man. At first, I thought it was my uncle who lived upstairs, but my door was still locked. I realized that I did recognize the man, he was always in my dreams as a child, he never spoke, just stood there, always in the background, and I never thought anything about it until that moment. I checked on my son and brought him back to my bed to sleep. A few days later, I was helping my mom go through some old photos she had been given from her family, she was raised by her aunt, and her family had been super secretive and possessive of photos and such. We were looking at a picture of a large family sitting around a long table. I recognized my mother's bio mom, my great aunt, and my great nana, and then, there he was. The man from my dreams and who woke me up. Sitting there next to my great nana, same look, same flannel shirt, pens in his pocket, and balding head. I pointed him out to my mom, it was her grandfather who passed away when she was a young girl. She was his favorite, and he wasn't afraid to show it. I explained what had been happening all my life, he was always in the background of my dreams and never said a word until I had my night terror. There was no way I ever saw a photo of him, and I had never met him in my life. I have so many paranormal stories that I should really write about them. Tomorrow I'm going to smudge my aunt's house because her son heard laughter at night and his room is freezing cold all of the time. I knew from the very moment I stepped foot in the house that something was amiss with that end of the house. When I was young, I always had a recurring nightmare about being chased by this blonde ghoul. She would always chase me through this dark, damp hallway. She would always catch up to me and punch me in the back, and I would go flying for ages and end up in a damp, concrete, square room. When I would wake up, my back would always be arched, and I couldn't move my legs. The dream stopped in about 2012, the year my dad bought a motorcycle, which prompted my love of riding. Skip forward four years, and I'm old enough to get my motorcycle license. As a gift, my dad bought me this old 1990s Virago, and I spent all summer riding. Then school comes back, grade 12, the second day of the school year, and I take my bike to school. Now, this day, the roads were a bit damp because it had rained the night before, but nothing I've ever come across before. I took my bike in anyway. As I'm riding to school, I go to make a right-hand turn. I start to slow down, the signal's on, I check my mirrors, there's nothing there, so I continue to slow down. That was when I was hit from behind by a young blonde woman. I was sent flying 100 feet into an intersection. When I came to, I couldn't feel my legs, and my back felt like it was bent in half like a wire. I don't know what was going on with my dreams, but it was so similar to my accident, and they happen so often, that I know that it couldn't have been a coincidence. In my late teens, I had nightmares quite frequently. That may not be the most accurate term, but it fits me. They were semi-lucid dreams in so far as I knew I wasn't awake, but I couldn't control what was happening. The nightmares were always different experiences, but I had the same objective in each one, to save as many people as I could from what was happening. People around me would be dying from a fire or being shot, or a wild animal would be killing them, and I would have to sacrifice myself to try and save them. The thing was, there was always this thing in my dreams with me. Once it was a doctor with no face, another time it was a bear, I even remember it being the front door to a house once. Whatever it was, it always had the same foreign feeling. I don't think I created it in my mind, I honestly think it came in. It would always be in the wrong place at the wrong time and hinder my objective in the nightmare. This would ensure my nightmare took the worst turn possible, and then I would get sacrificed in some way and die. I wouldn't wake up like you normally do when the bad thing gets you, though. It would continue until I experienced my own death, pain included. Then I'd stand up, maybe as a ghost, I still don't quite understand how or why, and just have an overwhelming need to scratch myself somewhere. I'd claw at my leg, back, or face, and the dream would end shortly after that. The next morning, I'd wake up to scratch marks on my body where I scratched myself in the dream. It always freaked me out, but then the dreams went away. Then one night I had a really bad one. I couldn't die, I couldn't scratch an itch, and I was getting afraid. My wife, my girlfriend at the time, tried waking me up. She said I wouldn't wake up, but I was crying. I vividly remember her waking me up and me being unable to move with a giant shadow looming over our bed. I don't think I'll ever forget feeling that helpless. I told her about it the next morning and came clean about the scratches, she had asked about them before. After that night, though, I didn't have the nightmares anymore. They just went away. Last year, I found out my wife had talked to the father at her church, who agreed to come to our apartment and bless the place. 
I guess he spent 45 minutes in the bedroom, and she said she had an uneasy feeling the whole time. I can't say it was paranormal and not just my imagination and me scratching myself in my sleep, but the piece that just bugs me so much is him blessing our place without my knowledge and the nightmares going away after that. I'm not exactly a religious man, but what the actual fuck. I'm shaking now and need to stop writing. When I was younger, I was made to stay at a friend's house for the night. What did you think? It was a giant manor that was built around the 1800s, even walking around during the day was creepy as the parents couldn't afford the upkeep, so it was falling apart. So I'm in his room and need to go pee, and the only bathroom was down a long hall with the only light being the toilet light at the end of the hulk. So I peek out the door and try and build up the balls to walk it, it's so long and scary, so I run fast and get there, sweet relief, but the whole time I get this chill, it really feels like someone is watching me as the door is still open behind me. I finish up, and as I turn to walk, I run back up, and I will never fucking forget this image. I see what I think is a head peering out from my friend's room, only the top half, and it's staring at me. I see old, weary gray hair, it's definitely an old man. I stand there for a second, and as soon as I blink, it's gone, and then I hear a load creak as if whatever I saw was moving back into the room. I spent three hours in the bathroom, door closed, with the plan to leg it back to his room when it was bright. Most definitely my imagination, but Jesus, my heart was pounding. There is no other response I've ever felt mentally than when I saw that head. I told my friend, and he just stated it was probably his late grandpa, he's seen him sometimes in his room. Thanks man. I've only had one experience, but it was a doozy. I was 16 or 17 at the time and worked at a restaurant that stayed open until around 2 AM, it had a bar too, so I got home pretty late. Sometimes I got groceries after, like I did this particular night, and got home even later. Add my 30 minute commute home to where we lived in the boonies, and I'm finally back around 4 AM. We lived by a lake in a pretty wooded area and had a big porch out front. I didn't pee at the store or on the way home, so I had to go. So, not having neighbors and being a guy, I found a tree. I grabbed my groceries and took them inside. It took forever because of where I had to park. I hated making two trips, but I couldn't carry my case of soda, so I went back for that. So I step out onto the porch, and what had been a hot, windy morning in Florida suddenly turned totally still and quiet. I paused, not sure what was off, just that something was wrong. I saw a light in the front yard, like a car coming down the road with those fancy white lights. But the shadows on the trees were all wrong. The light was coming from above, not from the side. I became away from a low hum, like an off-balance dryer far away. The light got brighter and brighter, and there was still no wind or movement. It was like that for, well, it felt like forever, but maybe 45 seconds. Then, as suddenly as they were there, the shadows faded. But they never went left or right, so whatever went left went up. I couldn't look up because of the porch awning, but I was so frozen in place, I don't know if I would have. I left the soda and bolted inside. I could never rationalize that one. 1988. When my daughter was around two years old, we moved to a, new to us, four bedroom house. Bedroom number one was for my wife and me, and bedroom number two was her room. Soon after moving in, we noticed that after putting her to bed for the night, we'd hear her talking and laughing long after she should have been asleep. Peeking in after about the third night of this, we found her standing at the end of her crib, chattering away with the closet door about five feet away. As typical new parents, we'd tell her to lie down and go to sleep. This continued for many nights, and then we noticed she was actually holding conversations, talk a little, listen some, answer yes or no or I don't know. When we asked her about it, she said she was talking to the lady in the green dress. This continued sporadically but eventually died down to the point where, if she was continuing the conversations, we weren't catching them. When we asked what she talked about, she either said stuff, school, daycare, or I don't know. Time passed, and her little brother was born. After the initial baby in the parents' room phase, we moved them together into the room. When he could stand on his own, pulling himself up on things, the same thing happened. We'd hear him babbling and peek in to see him doing the same thing, standing at the end of the crib, talking to the closet, his sister fast asleep in her bed. Again, it continues sporadically, slows, and stops. Three years go by. There are now two boys, so big sister gets her own room, and the two boys share the room same behavior from the youngest. We have no way of knowing if they discussed this among themselves, but each described a lady in a green dress. In asking them separately, one might mention she has long hair. A son might say, she has black hair. If asked if it's long or short, curly or straight, he'd say, 
it's long, and so on, in many details. When we heard a new detail from one and gave a multiple choice for that detail to the other, they'd always agree, belt or no belt, color, shoes, white lady, black lady, Indian lady, whatever. At this point, though, we're thinking they could all be remembering the same picture from a storybook or something. So, then weird stuff starts happening. Now, my wife and I were both smokers, and the rule was that one could smoke outside or in the bathroom upstairs, which had a ceiling exhaust fan, but nowhere else in the house. One fine, cold evening, too cold to go outside for just a smoke, I used this rule. I'd put the youngest to bed, the two older children were downstairs watching a movie. Suddenly, I hear them yelling the youngest child's name and running through the house. This makes more sense if you know the downstairs came up into the kitchen, go right and you're in the dining room, go right and you're in the hallway, go right and you're in the living room, go right and you're back in the kitchen. The older two were running this circle and yelling the youngest name in an exasperated way. So I step out my smoke and exit the bathroom just as the older two were making the circuit again. What's going on, you guys? We're chasing the youngest. He's supposed to be in bed. I peek into the bedroom. Yes, he is in bed. No, he's not. He just went into the kitchen again. We heard him on the stairs, and we just saw him run up. He's not supposed to be awake watching movies now, so we tried to tell him, but he kept going around the corner, so we ran after him. So, basically, they glimpsed someone on the steps and chased the figure. Every time they turned a corner in this circuit, they caught just a glimpse of the figure turning the next corner and continued the chase. My youngest was truly asleep. Turned bedroom number three into a study. It was downstairs. One day I'm home in my study, my wife is at work, and my kids are at school. Someone is pacing the floor above me. A slow walk from one end of the living room directly above me, then back again. Since I know no one is home, I guess it's my sister-in-law, who has a key and a pension for dropping by from time to time unannounced. I go upstairs, the doors are all locked, and nobody is there. Could it be street traffic? But it was exactly the sound of someone walking above, that one squeaky floorboard and everything. I mentioned this to my wife. Oh, you heard the walking man. When I stayed home sick that day last month, I heard it all the time. Someone was walking back and forth in the living room, but nobody was ever there when I checked. Okay, so we got that going for us, which is nice. I'm wondering how to enlist this character to push a vacuum cleaner while he's at it. No more green lady chats, no more phantom kids running around the house. The walking man is heard from time to time, but I've learned to ignore him. He doesn't answer questions or anything like that. We've left out pen and paper, not a, okay, we're cool, he's cool, whatever. 2000. We're moving, we just need a bigger house. The realtor assures us we don't have to mention the other residents to prospective buyers, so that's nice. Most of the stuff is packed up and moved into storage, so the house shows well. Someone buys it, and we start packing the last of everything so we can move later in the week. With the shows well, it just looked. Roomy. Now it actually looks like a place someone is leaving. My oldest son, still in the number two room, the green lady room bedroom, where he shares bunk beds with his younger brother, gets up in the night to use the bathroom. In the living room, clearly visible down the hall, is a tall man standing and staring at the wall, his back to my son. My son said he knew instantly that it wasn't me. This tall figure begins to turn slowly towards my son. My son changes his mind about using the bathroom and runs back into his own room, where there's a woman sitting on the floor. On her lap is a small child. They're both looking at my son, who at this point is screaming his head off and running into our room, bed, and covers. So we check, and there's nobody else in the house, of course. For the next couple of nights, just cuz, we set up a video camera in the corner of the living room that would give the most coverage. We don't have motion sensors, and the tape runs for 8 hours or so on the lowest quality, but in the 2 or 3 nights we taped after bedtime, nothing happened, at least nothing caught on tape. And we moved, and that's it. Except. We never really noticed until the move, but when you walk into a house and there's nobody home, you somehow feel that. I'm home, and I'm the first one home, and I'm the only one home. We realized that we had never felt that since 1988, only in the new house. My wife also said it felt lonely to be the first one to come home to the new house. So at some level, maybe we all sense something. I don't know. When I was about 13 years old, we lived in a really old house that was on a farm. One time, my parents were out really late, and me and my brother were the only ones home. I was sitting in living room number one, and my brother went to go get a drink of water or something. My kitchen was next to another sort of living room, living room number two, 
and it had a sort of bar on the side with a big window cut into the wall, so you could see into the kitchen from living room number two. All these rooms are very small, so when my brother left LR number one, I saw him stop dead in his tracks in LR number two, facing the bar and looking into the kitchen. He walked back in, and I asked what happened. He said he saw a black figure with glowing red eyes. Me and my brother used to love ghost hunting and stuff like that, but I can tell when he's seriously scared. So a few weeks later, my brother had a friend over, and he left the room to go grab his bag in LR number one. He came running back into the room and said, dude, I saw a black shadow in the kitchen with red eyes. I immediately suspected my brother was trying to mess with me, so I looked at him and said, shut up, stop, and laughed it off. But my brother's friend asked what I was talking about, and my brother swore on our dead dog, that was something we didn't mess with, that he never told anyone except me. That house had a lot of creepy feelings and negative energies. We had about seven pets die in that house. We never looked back when we left. Me and some friends went camping out on a big Indian reserve for a music festival, I was not fucked up. Side note, I had lost my voice a few days before, wasn't sick, just lost my voice, so I had a little shit whistle around my neck and no voice. Two friends and I had walked back to our campsite after some music. It was nighttime, but still very early in the evening. Friend one climbs into the tent, she had taken a Xanax or something and was knocked out quick. I grab some water with friend two from the cooler, maybe 15 feet away, and then we walk back to bother friend one at her tent. I'm a few feet in front of friend two when. All of a sudden, out of thin air, two Native American girls, 10 to 14 years old, sprint past us to the opposite side of the tent and stop at the tent door. I'm about three feet away from these girls. I see, plain as day, that they are wearing authentic Native American clothing. For a split second, I thought they were just kids running around the festival in costume. Then, one of the young girls starts vigorously scratching at the tent, whispering to be let in. Let us in, we have to be let in. Open the door. As they continue to scratch at the tent, they seem to glitch back and forth, up close and far away, with the blink of an eye, kind of like in the ring. That's when I notice their eyes. Their eyes are completely black. No white. No iris. Black. I am now scared, and tears of fear are streaming down my face. Remember, I have no voice, so I couldn't scream, and that crap whistle wasn't blowing shit. Friend 2 is still standing on the opposite side of the tent, away from the girls, and can't directly see what I see, their eyes. She takes notice of me freaking out and hurries to stand with me. And it all clicks for her too, this is not right. Friend 2 starts screaming at friend 1 to get TF up. Friend 2 then goes on to tell friend 1 what just happened outside her tent, word for word, without any input from my, mute, self. If friend 2 hadn't seen it, I may have thought I got laced. But we both saw the same thing. Needless to say, we piled into our car for the remainder of the night and ended up leaving the next day. This happened one summer in Mexico on a small ranch or village. I saw a girl get passed once. She fainted, and I caught her. We put her to bed, and she started acting weird. She was crying and didn't want to open her eyes because she would see little demons or something. Her dad was murdered when she was young and kept insisting he wanted her to go with him, saying she could see him giving her his hand. Four grown men struggled to keep her from raising her hand to grab her dad's. This went on for a few days, with people constantly by her side. The part that really tripped me out was that she started speaking English. She was adamant that her crush was going to come from work and that she had to take good care of their baby. She didn't have kids. I forgot how she calmed down, but she ended up leaving for her mother's house in the city, where she got better to the point where they felt she was okay to go home to her grandmother's house. As soon as she went into the room she was in, she burst out running and just kept going and going and going. She left for good. I ended up coming to the US with family and never really looked back. To this day, I don't know if she just had a mental breakdown or what, but mental breakdowns don't teach you languages you don't speak or make you way stronger than you should be. Four years ago, I moved into my first apartment. It was a small studio with no bedroom door. It was the first time I've ever lived on my own, and I brought my two cats with me. I had a long mirror hanging on my closet door. Many nights, I felt like something dark was in the mirror and was watching me. I kept telling myself that it was in my mind, and this was the first time living on my own, and I was just trying to get used to things. The sight and feeling happened most nights. One day I was sitting on my couch and heard a rustling noise. I looked over at my trash can. It was a swing lid, and I watched it swing to the right, then to the left, and then it stopped. I walked over to inspect. No vent air was hitting it, both cats were in the bedroom, and there wasn't any trash inside. 
I thought it was strange, but I pushed it out of my mind. A couple months later, a friend and her three-year-old daughter came over, and we hung out on my patio. Her daughter kept going in and out of my apartment, shutting the sliding glass door behind her each time. After a while, she ran to the glass door in a panic and opened it, jumped out, and slammed it shut. Then he threw a rock at the glass door. We asked her what was wrong and what scared her. We asked her if the cat scared her or a spider. She simply replied, ghost. I was stunned. I hadn't told anyone what was going on before this. After a while, things started to happen more and more. My cats would fight on my bed or be doing something on my bed and then would all of a sudden stop and look at the top left corner of my bedroom simultaneously. It would always be in the left corner. I always checked to see if it was a bug, dust, or anything else, and it wasn't. They would be facing the opposite direction, and then both would turn and look at that corner. One day I went into my bedroom to get a winter headband for my closet. I looked at my bed before walking into the closet and, for some reason, made a mental note that my bed was made and nothing but two pillows were on it. I'm normally a messy person. I walked into my closet, knowing the headband was there because I had seen it the day before. I couldn't find it and said, screw it, I'll just wear the hat I found. I turned and walked out of the closet, and draping off the side of the bed right in front of the closet door was my headband. As time went on, I became more and more freaked out, so I started sleeping with the bathroom light on. I woke up one night and felt two very light footprints at the end of my bed. I looked around and saw one cat fast asleep in the cat tree in the corner, and the other fast asleep next to my pillow. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the corner of my comforter flip up. Then all of a sudden, it felt like a large hand grabbed the right side of my face, and I felt like I was spinning and sick. I kept trying to force my eyes open, but I couldn't. It had to have been for 15 seconds, but it felt longer. Finally, I was able to open my eyes, and the spinning and ill feeling stopped. Shortly after, I felt two light footprints at the end of my bed again. Things would happen, and then nothing for a couple of months. One night I woke up and saw my hair brush and night cream slam onto the ground. At first, I thought it was my older cat because she liked to knock things over to wake me up. I kept calling her name, and my younger cat walked in from the living room to inspect what was going on. I kept calling my older cat's name and peered into the living room and saw her, but she wouldn't come into the room. She looked scared. To further explain why it wouldn't be anything else, my bathroom countertop had a round curve that went upwards, so something couldn't easily slide off. I had also closed the vent in my bathroom because it would blow hot air onto my hair products. After some time, I rented a bigger apartment in that complex. I went to the first one to clean the bathroom, and I was there by myself. A figure walked past the door. After moving into my second apartment, the realization that I was being followed by the spirit came to light. It knocked on my door, and without realizing it, I let it in. Thus, more things have happened, and now, living in a townhouse, it still appears every so often. I came into this one really late, but this is too good not to share. My mom told me this when she was younger, and it's a story that makes a shiver go down my spine. My grandfather died when my mom was in her early years of high school. I obviously never met him, nor do I really know anything about him. She doesn't really speak of him much. She and her best friend, Anne, were leaving a party when they were in their late teens and were about to walk a half hour home when they got offered a lift by a car full of guys they knew. They accepted it as late and got the overloaded car. A few minutes after they started driving, mom and Anne realized these guys had been drinking, but it wasn't so unacceptable back then, so they didn't think much of it. A few minutes go by, and mom swears on her life. She hears a male voice saying, get out of the car, you will die. It was calm, but there was such urgency in the voice that she screamed at them to pull over. Mum said she had this overwhelming feeling of dread and fear and that she could hardly breathe, she felt like she was literally drowning. She got out of the car and almost dragged Anne out with her. and didn't want to walk home, so they were arguing for a little while before reluctantly going with her. The guys went on their way. They walked the rest of the way home. My grandma got a call the next day saying that her good friends had swerved off the road, rolled an embankment, and crashed into a lake. It was all five guys from the car. They all died, some from drowning and some from the impact. If mom and Anne weren't wearing seatbelts, they would have been gone. She believes it was her dad who told her to get out. She had or has never felt anything like that feeling. Scary shit. I live with my parents and was home alone one day. I had just gotten off of work and was taking my standard post-work shit it was maybe 12 in the afternoon, and neither of my parents got home from work until at least 3.30 to 4 p.m. Since I was alone, I was shitting with the door open when I heard my laundry room door open. My laundry room door connects to the garage, 
so I figured one of my parents got home early and came in through the garage door. I closed the bathroom door slightly and yelled hello but didn't get a response. I yelled hello again, but there was no response. It was at this point that I realized I hadn't heard any footsteps come into the house yet. We have old wood floors that creak really loud whenever you walk on them, so it's always obvious when anybody is walking anywhere in the house. I finish wiping my ass and get up to see who's home. As I'm standing up, I hear the laundry room door slam closed. I walk towards the laundry room and into the garage since I would catch whichever parent was home leaving the driveway. I open the laundry room door, and the garage is shut and the light turned off, our garage light stays on for 15 minutes after someone has opened the door before turning it off. I was kind of freaked out now, so I locked the door and went into my room to watch YouTube videos. As I'm loading up a video, I hear the door that connects to my patio from my parents' bathroom open and close twice. I grabbed a fork, the only weapon near me at the time, and crept around the corner to see who was there. Nothing. Nobody. I waited outside their bedroom door for about 15 minutes in hopes of catching a burglar sneaking out of the closet, but no results came up. I freaked out, ran into my room, and watched my door, just listening for anything else spooky going on. Nothing else happened, and I still don't have a reasonable explanation for it to this day. I'll share my most recent, of many. There is a pattern in my life where I have premonitions, or contact, regarding the trauma or death of loved ones. I had a friend who lived 2,500 miles away. He had an incurable brain tumor but was hospitalized for something somewhat unrelated. It was a grave situation, and I knew that he was in trouble. However, my life was too hectic to give it 100% of my mental energy, as I was consumed with work and my own life. Facebook well wishes and prayers were sent, and I expected him to recover and go back home. A night or two later, I awoke from a nighttime terror or sleep paralysis. There was a loud noise that sounded like someone was pounding on the front door. Knock, knock, knock. It was what you would expect from a SWAT team before they crashed in. That sent me into a state of semi-lucidity, and I entered into a waking dream. In this dream, I fixated on my bedroom door, waiting for the intruders to burst in. The door slowly cracked, and a giant, meaty hand squeezed through the opening. My heart was pounding, and I was in fear of cardiac arrest. I knew that I was dreaming, but it felt so intensely real that my body reacted accordingly. The dark figure's shadow filled the entire doorway, and the hand, for lack of a better description, waved at me like a small child would wave. I was both terrified and comforted, if that makes any sense at all. Here was this huge monster who was both scaring me and trying to console me at the same time. Upon awakening in the morning, I described this to my husband. I rarely have sleep paralysis, and it almost always corresponds to some specific event. I made coffee and went online. Sure enough, I found that my friend had passed away in the night. During the exact time that I had the dream, he was semi-conscious, and his family described how he was holding up his hand and waving at them from his hospital bed. My friend was a giant man, and, in retrospect, the huge shadow and large, meaty hand were exactly the size that would have been his. Now the kicker. A few weeks later, I went back through our messages and found one where, two years earlier, I had invited him and his wife to come visit and stay with us. His reply was, some night you will wake up to a knock, knock, knock on your door. This story is 100% true, and I'm having goosebumps and tears just thinking about it. My wife and I were living at my grandma's house, it's a very large house, and we had the entire upstairs. My wife and I were in the master bedroom, and our three-month-old daughter was in a front bedroom across the hall from us. We had one of those new fancy baby monitors that has a breathing sensor and all that. Primarily, if our daughter tossed it wrong, this stupid thing went off, but we kept on with it as we were new parents. One night, while trying to go to sleep, my wife and I were lying in bed talking about the week's happenings. Basically, we just shot the SHT till we got tired enough to go to sleep. We finally stopped talking and were ready to sleep, so we turned up the baby monitor so it would be loud enough to wake us if the alarm sounded or if our daughter started crying for one reason or another. As I lay there trying to nod off, I heard what I thought was breathing over the monitor. It was kind of distorted, like bad reception. So I would listen more carefully to be sure it wasn't malfunctioning. I heard my daughter moving around, and that came through clearly. So I figured it was just some interference with the monitor. However, a few moments later, I heard, clear as day, over the monitor, an older woman's voice saying, shh, it's okay. In a very soft and almost comforting tone. However, being a new father living where we did, I freaked out. Leaping out of bed, thinking that someone was in my daughter's room about to kidnap her or something, I ran through the hall and burst into her room. Her room was near pitch black, but for the little toy thing we had on her crib, 
it would give a constant soft glow, and if there was noise, be it a kick or crying, it would turn on, move, and play soft music. That was on in the middle of its song, my daughter appeared to be asleep, and no one was in the room. Figuring I must have dreamt the voice, I walked over to pick up my daughter to comfort her and myself at this point. When I picked her up, I noticed she was very, very warm. I checked her temperature, and it was a dangerous 103 degrees. Now, before we put her to bed, she was fine, only three hours had passed since then, which probably means her temperature would have continued rising throughout the night had something not made me go in there. My wife and I can only conclude to this day that the ghost of the old woman that we are pretty sure is in my grandmother's house was the one who got me in there. My grandma's house is over 110 years old and holds a lot of history. So, to this day, we are thankful for this ghost or happening, or whatever you want to call it, and we are quite certain that whatever it was, it saved our child's life. So growing up as a child, my family and I lived in an old carriage barn nursery that was built in the late 60s and early 70s by two men. One was a bachelor, who eventually sold us the place, and the other was a single dad. Well, apparently, while building the place, the dad had a heart attack and fell dead on the bottom floor. It should also be mentioned that the area this place was built in was known for finding Indian artifacts such as arrowheads, pottery shards, etc. Many years later, in 2001, my family bought the place, and from the get-go, spooky things occurred. I was seven at the time, and I would sleepwalk, occasionally waking my parents up and telling them there was a man in the house. Things that were in cupboards before we all went to sleep would be on the counter in the morning or in the sink as though they'd just been used. Well, one winter morning, I'm like 11 or 12, I wake up super cold. I apparently walked outside the house in the middle of the night and into the rose garden, ending up under a lady bank rose that hadn't been doing very well. My face and hands were all scratched up, like I'd been pulling at the bush. Well, I pick myself up and go back inside. Later that day, my mom tells me she wants me to transplant the exact bush to a place with more sun, maybe that'll help it. So I go down to the garden and begin digging up the bush, being careful of the roots as I dig around it. Eventually, I hear the noise of metal shearing on metal. I think, damn, mom and dad are going to be angry that I broke an irrigation pipe. I reach down into the hole I dug and feel a sharp corner. I dig a little more and find a slightly rusted metal box with a lock on it. Buried treasure. My overactive mind assumed. I smack the box open, and inside is a sheaf of paper wrapped in a sandwich baggie. I read them out loud. Treasure map riddle? No, it's a suicide letter from the girl, whose father had a heart attack while building the place. Apparently, in her teens, she was so distraught at losing her father and the prospect of having to live with her mother's family that she killed herself. After that day, I never had visions of a man coming to me in my sleep, and I stopped sleep waking too. My friends called me one night to go to a basketball game at the Civic Center. My buddy Crazy Legs was driving, and he and I had a rule among all of our friends that I always rode a shotgun in his vehicle and he always rode a shotgun in mine. I went out to the car to get in, and something was just telling me not to go. It was like I physically couldn't get in the vehicle. My other friend had already gotten out of the front seat and got in the back with my other friend to give me my seat. They gave me hell, but I eventually didn't go. Something just physically would not let me in the car. It was like I was frozen with fear or something. Well, anyway, on their way home from the game that night, they lost control of the vehicle because it was pouring rain and slid sideways underneath an 18-wheeler trailer that was loaded down with flooring tile. All three of my friends were severely injured, considering they were driving a Chevy Cavalier, and the 18-wheeler wheels literally drove over top of the vehicle. This all occurred around midnight. All three of my friends suffered serious lifelong injuries. The one who was sitting where I should have been eventually committed suicide due to his constant pain from being in his 20s and walking with a cane from his broken legs, neck, back, pelvis, jaw, you name it. I still wonder today if I would have died that night and why I didn't get in the car because I had nothing better to do that night, no work the next day, and the tickets were free. I was around 9 or 10 at the time this story happened. My best friend and I had been riding our bikes, just being kids and screwing off. We lived in one of those older towns that are filled with older homes and kind of compacted, so the roads turned to dirt and fields pretty quick. We were maybe five or six blocks from my house when we found a new road to explore, and we followed it down. We passed a church, took an L turn, and were basically out of town and in the country in a few feet. We could see an old bridge a ways down, so we took off to check it out. The ride from the turn to the bridge was a little less than a half mile. As we get closer and closer to the bridge, I start to notice something is wrong with it. It's an old metal and concrete bridge, the metal is painted red, but it's peeling pretty badly, 
and the whole thing is leaning heavily to the left. There are two big piles of rock blocking each side of the bridge, and we stop our bikes at the first one. It's really quiet, and I immediately want to leave this place. I hated being there from the start. My friend calls me a chicken, gets off her bike, and climbs the first rock pile. I refuse to leave my bike, even when she spots an armadillo and chases it, barking. As she hits the rock pile on the other side of this bridge, it's like she suddenly senses what I do. She slowly turns, and she is pale as fuck, saying we need to leave. I don't argue, I just wait for her to get back, because I'm not leaving her, and we take off. The whole ride to the bridge was easy, our wheels glided like they were on the pavement, not gravel. The ride back, though, is like trying to pedal through thick mud. We are both standing up to pedal harder, and it feels like we are just creeping along. We stop about 100 feet away to catch our breath and look back, and there's this huge light, like a mini sun, hanging above the bridge. I'm freaking out, and I look at my friend in a do you see this shit way, and she looks back, terrified, and whimpers, go, go, go. Neither of us waits, we jump back on the pedals and pedal for all they're worth. We make it almost back to the turn, and this section of the road is lined with trees for a good bit, and I can see something black flashing between the trees right behind us. We hear a vehicle and think adults, so we're safe, at least safe enough to stop for air. We stop and see this truck pulling down a driveway and onto the road. About a second later, we forget about the truck. There is now a red rectangle of light, like a tail light, gliding about 7 feet off the road, left to right, between trees on either side of the road. We are both watching this shit as the truck pulls up in front of it and stops, and I thought maybe the people in the truck saw it too. They probably didn't, because after waiting a good minute for our dumbasses to move out of the road, they honked at us. That honk was all we needed to get our asses back to pedaling home. We never really went exploring too much after that and spent the rest of the day in the house. I was telling the story later on in my late teens and early 20s, and one of the people in the group was familiar with the road. They had lived on the road not far from the bridge, and weird things would happen in their house. They explained to me that the bridge leads to a drunkard's house. One night, this guy is headed home completely sloshed and misses the bridge, hitting the edge and flying into the overfull creek below. They search for a few weeks and eventually recover his truck, but he's never found. It's one of the creepiest things that's happened to me. My favorite city to visit is Savannah, Georgia, so after I graduated college, my parents took me there for a long weekend to celebrate. My mother loves to watch those ghost hunter shows, and with Savannah being one of the most haunted cities, she was super excited. We stayed at the Marshall House, which is one of the oldest hotels in the city. It also happened to be a yellow fever hospital at one point in its long history. We ended up getting a suite with a bedroom separated via French doors to a living room with a fireplace and a pull-out couch where I slept. Night 1, I'm getting my bed ready, and my mother dearest comes in and puts one of those flashlights that you see the ghost hunt people using all the time, because it's very easy to turn on and off, on the mantle of the fireplace facing me. I said, oh, hell no. She thought it was the funniest thing. Fast forward to morning and no flashlight, thank the lord. But apparently dad got up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and when he walked out of the bathroom, he had to close the bathroom door so he could make his way back to bed. He laid down, thought about it, and then it dawned on him that he wouldn't have been able to get in the bathroom if the door to the bathroom was open to begin with. Mother was so excited that we could actually be in a haunted room. Our last full day there, we had breakfast delivered to the room so we could eat on the balcony on the rocking chairs. I had finished my food, so I came back inside, sat on the couch, and started reading either brochures or magazines or something. The ceilings were high, and there was a ceiling fan with three lights on it, but since we got there, only one of the bulbs worked, so we just supplemented with the table lamps. I hadn't turned on the lamp yet when dad walked inside. He told me to turn on the lamp so I could see better, and as I started reaching for the lamp, both of the other light bulbs and the ceiling fan turned on. At this point, the mother is pissed because nothing has happened to her yet and the flashlight is yet to turn on. So she's talking to whatever is in the room, trying to provoke it. I probably could have done without that. We went to bed that night, and the damn flashlight was still on the mantel. My parents shut the French doors, and I put the flashlight in my purse because I was over it. I fell asleep but woke up at some point in the night to what sounded like someone getting up from the chair in the room. Damn it. So the way the room was set up, the pull-out couch was on the same wall as the door that opened up to the hallway, the fireplace was to my left, and the chair was near the lower left corner of the bed. Then I hear what sounds like heavy boots slowly walk from the chair, around my bed, and towards the door. Then I hear a clink on the side table in between the bed and the door. I was not about to open my eyes and see some Civil War soldier standing next to my bed, 
So my eyes were glued shut, and I just remember thinking that if anything touches me, I'm out. It was probably two seconds, but it felt like two minutes passed before I heard the boots walk down the hallway away from our door. At this point, my heart is beating out of its chest, and all I could think was, if that damn flashlight is in my purse, so help me, God. I waited a few minutes before I got enough courage to unfurl from the blankets, eyes closed still, and reach for the lamp. When I did open my eyes, nothing happened. And there was nothing on the side table. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. And her mother was pissed that nothing happened to her on this trip. When I was younger, my sister started getting into witchcraft and demons. I shared a room with her, and slowly I watched her change from someone so down to earth to a person on the verge of insanity. I feel like she was possessed for the duration of my childhood, and the reason being that she began making her own Ouija boards. When it first started out, I'll admit I began having some crazy dreams, and her attitude towards me and my family had changed. She tried to kill my parents by lighting their room on fire, and she'd oftentimes hurt me. She'd speak gibberish in her sleep and laugh sometimes, it was weird, but things really began to get freaky when she started wanting blood for her rituals. That's where I came in. My parents worked a lot, so she usually babysat me. So when parents would leave, she'd conduct her rituals in our bedroom, where she'd cut me, smear my blood on her weird board, light her candles, then stuff me in the closet. Mind you, I was a young child, so the dark already scared me enough, but the worst thing was when I started hearing whispers. It was coming from all around me in the closet, and I could feel like breathing down my back. I remember crying and banging on the closet because I had started seeing things. I'd elaborate more, but it's night here, and I feel like this will just get lost in the comments. Anyway, my sister didn't let me out until I was gasping for air, something was strangling me. From then on, I heard voices and continued to see things. I hardly slept at night because I'd continue to hear these voices until the point where I could see literal shadows over my bed. It didn't stop until she moved out. Now whenever I'm sleep deprived, I have strange dreams, and I'll end up writing down my thoughts and what I see in my dreams instead of taking notes in my classes, and I'll be doing it while knocked out. Five of my friends went to this club that was really expensive to get in, and being a poor student me and two others decided to go on the beach. Our apartments faced the beach and we had steps going down to our apartment, but you could also get to it from the back, by walking down an alleyway with a sensor light that lit up when you walked down it. We get to this alley and I start freaking out and feeling scared to the point of almost crying. We walk down the alley onto the beach. No one seems to be around. We walk down the beach seeing no one, and I still feel a bit freaked out. I look up after walking for a few seconds and see this black opaque figure in the alley we had just walked down with its arms stuck out to its sides. I'm freaked out, but try to keep my cool. It looks as though it's about 7 feet tall, and we're away from it, so it would be taller up close. I go what the fuck is that and run along to the beach to the left, and into the dock where there are street lamps, because I'm that terrified. My friends follow, and my skeptical friend asks what I'm doing, thinking I'm being mad. Before I can speak, my other friend says did you not see that black figure? Skeptical friend, who started running a couple of seconds after me and looked up at the alley, says he did not see anything in the alley after we told him what we saw, and tries to come up with answers, for example was it an ill person, which is why they look so weird. Obviously we don't know, but my other friend and I both saw it and were freaked out. It was freakishly tall, seemed sinister, and had a black, opaque look to it. We saw no one and heard no one when walking down the alley. I go back to my apartment, eight of us were sharing two apartments, and make them wait till 2 a.m. until the others come back. For the next couple of days I feel freaked out sleeping in the room I share with another friend and feel like something is watching me from the corner, although that could be because I was freaked out from this experience. Two days later we are on the beach and I need the loo. I'm very poo shy, so take all three keys to our apartment and check no one needs to go in, saying I'll be five minutes. I go in with the keys in a pocket and go to the loo. I had been playing a trick on a friend as the toilet light switch was in the hallway outside the loo, and had been turning it off when she was in there, I was immature. I was on the toilet and suddenly all the lights went off, both in the loo and in the hall, I could see through the crack under the door that the hall light was off. I heard laughter and footsteps and assumed I had left a key and my friends were playing a prank on me. I still felt afraid and my phone went off, and I saw I had texts from my friends begging me to let them in. I washed my hands and opened the door, terrified but still convinced that it was a prank. I went into the hallway and all the lights were off. I went into the living room where the main door was and saw all of my friends there outside waiting for me looking puzzled, and when I asked later they said they felt that they should come back. I checked my pockets and I had all three keys, and when asking the neighbors found out they had not had a power cut. The light switch next to the bathroom had also been switched down, 
so it seemed as though this entity had been watching me play this prank on my friend, and had copied it. I saw the black figure again down a different alleyway near some caves on the beach. We went on a ghost walk and were told about a mayor that was hanged in the area. Me and the friend who had seen the figure just stared at each other at this point, and the ghost walk leader said wow, have you seen it? Although that could have been her trying to make the ghost walk scarier and this figure didn't really look hanged, if that makes sense. We got back from the ghost walk to find that our friends had started a food fight between apartments. They ran onto the beach but some went round the front and some went round the back and down the alleyway where I first saw this figure. I ran behind them but hadn't put my shoes on so was behind them, it was gravelly, and saw the figure ahead of me. But it wasn't in the alleyway I had first seen it in or the second one, it's hard to describe, perhaps I can find pictures of the surroundings, and it was at a different angle and was on the side road ahead instead of down the first alleyway which would have been to the right. I stopped and ran back to the apartment. The next day I made our friend drive some of us down these roads where these alleys and side roads were and there were no statues or anything that looked like this figure. On the last day of the holiday we went into the other apartment our friends were in, which wasn't where I had had my occurrences for example with the lights going off, but it was next to the alley where I first saw this figure, and the kettle was unplugged for a phone charger to go in, and was taken off the kettle stand that kettles used to boil on, can't think of the name. It boiled by itself, whilst not plugged in or the stand. This could have been a ghost or some dude that bears a striking resemblance. About a year ago, I was out riding my motorcycle on this long rural highway. There wasn't much around but farmland and a few cars here and there. Well, I saw this old country store slash gas station and decided to stop in and rest a bit. So I'm standing there smoking a cigarette and having a drink when this dude on a Harley shovel head rolls up with long, stringy hair and dresses like he's straight out of Easy Rider. He yells over the motor, your back tire looks low, better check it out. Then he just rides off. Now this guy was pretty memorable, not just because of how he looked but also because he wasn't wearing a helmet, which struck me as odd due to the fact that my state has had a helmet law for decades. I started looking at my rear tire, and sure enough, I could hear a hiss and found a small hole. My guess is that I picked up a nail and it just came out. So I walk inside the store to see if they have any plugs for my tire. I go up to the cashier to pay for my stuff, and this dude's picture is hanging on the wall behind the counter. I'm staring at this old picture, and I'm certain it's him, so I ask the cashier, hey, the guy in that picture, do you know him? I'm pretty sure he just saved my life. He rode up just now and told me that my rear tire looked low, and he was right. If I'd rode out of here, it would have gone flat with me tearing down the road at 70 miles per hour. That would have been bad. She looked at me all bug-eyed and said, yeah, that's my father. He's been dead for almost 50 years. I started laughing and said, I guess it was a ghost. How'd he die? She said, he died in an accident on his motorcycle. He lost control and hit a tree. They said it looked like his tire went flat. Oh, and you ain't the first person who said they've seen them. I wasn't laughing at this point, and I asked her, what kind of bike did he ride? A 66 Harley shovel head. I needed another cigarette. When I was younger, I used to be terrified of the guest room in my house. I hated being near it or even looking at it while the door was open. Once, my mom was in there folding laundry because the bed was the only place we had to stack clothes. I was in the room with her because she was making me help her. Well, she left the room for a minute or two to go get more clothes to fold, and as I was standing there, I suddenly felt like something was watching me, and then I heard a voice yell in my ear, get out. I don't remember what I did next, but as I grew older, I eventually grew out of the fear of this room. About a year ago, I decided that I wanted to move my bedroom to this room since I liked the paint a lot more and there were holes in the wall of my old room. I am fully convinced that something does not want me in that room. I've heard voices call my name, the electricity suddenly goes out, but only in that room, and numerous other things happen. The one that scares me the most, though, is the door. Sometimes, at night when I'm sleeping, the door will open itself. It started out as just creeping open slowly, slow enough that I thought I just hadn't closed the door all the way. But one night, it slammed open hard enough to break the door stopper and put a hole in my wall. Whatever is in my house doesn't want me in that room with the door shut, and I don't know why. I even got home one day and noticed that it looked like someone had used a crowbar to pull out part of the door frame, which now gets in the way when I'm closing the door, making it harder to shut. I also have a few other experiences with a Ouija board that I don't feel like typing out right now, but I can later if anyone wants me to. I can also post pictures of the hole in the wall and the door frame if anyone wants. When I was a kid, I was about 4 to 6 years old. I had an imaginary friend. His name was John Crossan. I would see him as a little blonde boy about my age. This went on for a while, and my parents thought it was cute. 
It probably went on for a few years. It came to the point where my parents would refer to him and tell me about him. I'm sure they thought it was cute. We would play games, talk, and do whatever normal kids would do. I do remember in my mind's eye that he was always impeccably dressed. Literally, a suit and tie. One of those old-fashioned suits with short pants and a ribbon tie. He seemed to be a bit older than me. But he never said how old. For a long time, things were fun, cute, and typical for a little kid. I had bunk beds. The top was his, and the bottom was mine. He also had this very strange power when he was around. My dad used to yell at me a lot. If dad was yelling at me and John was there, he would smile and indicate that I should watch him. He would blink his eyes tight and long, and my angry dad would be gone. He would leave the room. I have no memory of the issue. I really love that. Then it happened. I remember we went camping. It was in the Rocky Mountains and very beautiful. Especially at night. One night, something happened. The Milky Way was stretched across the sky. This is when John revealed himself. He asked me if I wanted to see what he really looked like. This confused me. I thought I knew what he looked like. He asked again. Do you want to see what I really look like? He told me to look up at the mountains. Then he or she began to rise from behind the mountains. This giant, grinning, distorted Pinocchio looking thing began to rise from behind the mountain. It really scared me. It was gigantic and rose over the mountains I was looking at. It grinned at me. It was him. It was John showing me what he looked like. This distorted clown like golem marionette. I was scared. I was freaked out. I wanted to be anywhere but there. Eventually, we went home. So, I stopped playing with my imaginary friend. I told my parents I wasn't playing with John anymore. I really didn't tell them why. I told him he was gone and wasn't coming back. Now, my parents managed the apartment building we lived in. About two weeks after the camping trip, we had a new person move into the building. His name was John Crossan. They wanted me to meet him because they thought it was a funny coincidence. I didn't want to. I couldn't explain why, but I protested and argued with them. I had no desire to meet this man. Eventually they could tell I was scared and stopped pushing. Obviously, we were all freaked out a bit. My roommate and I are convinced we have a third roommate now. We've lived in another apartment that had really thin walls and floors, but our current place is nice. The only time I've heard our neighbors say this is when the kid above jumps up and down, so his full weight slams down. The first occurrence we remember was when my roommate told me she'd been watching TV in her room when she heard me yell something down the hallway. She figured the dog had gotten into trouble or something, but then she heard me call her name. Thinking I needed help, she walked down the hall to my room, just to find my dog asleep on the bed. I had been gone for a few hours running errands, and she had no idea I wasn't home. My own experience happened one evening after making dinner. I was eating in my room, watching TV, when I heard the front door close. A couple of footsteps followed, and then my roommate's bedroom door creaked open and closed. I walked over to see if she wanted some dinner, but her bedroom door was open and she was gone. I sent her a quick text asking if she had come home and then left really quick. She said she had still been at work and wouldn't be home for more than an hour. Lastly, my little sister had slept over, and while I was finishing up work, I worked from home, she went to watch TV on the living room couch. She suddenly came back into my room with a blanket wrapped around her and a frightened look on her face. She'd been lying on the couch playing games on her phone when someone pushed a corner of the couch. I'd shrugged it off, thinking she probably fell asleep and her body jerked or twitched, right? But when I looked at the couch with her, you could see a mark in the carpet where the corner of it had moved where she felt. This was an old, heavy couch, it takes a lot to move it around. Unfortunately, our third roommate doesn't help pay rent. I came home from work late one night, probably from working a second shift. It would have been around midnight. I park on the street next to my house and walk around to the front, which faces a different street. As I am doing this, an old, rusty pickup slowly cruises past me, heading toward where I had parked. I recognize the truck as one used by guys who are often knocking on doors asking for handouts, money, or junk to recycle. Creepy people, and not because they want help but because they are creepy. If you looked up photos of people likely to be murderers, they might be on the photo lineup. So I am crossing my front yard at this point with my back to where I had parked and that pickup truck that had gone past me, and suddenly in my head, in my brain, in my whole damn body, I hear the loudest sound I have ever heard, and it's a voice saying turn around now. In both a level of volume and intensity I have never heard before or since. It was a command. Not a request. An order. And the authority behind it was unlike anything I knew. Just typing this has me in tears. 
There just isn't any way I know to put into words how powerful this command was or how it felt like the merest fragment of a dust mite's lost dandruff of the power behind it. I can't even describe the contrast properly. So, of course, I turned around. And one of the guys from this junk truck had come out of that truck and was sneaking up behind me. I had heard nothing. I was so focused on things to do once I got into my house that I just heard nothing. He was 10 feet away when I turned. And in the loudest voice I myself have ever made, I said, stop. And he froze and stood there. And they turned and ran back to the pickup truck, and they left. And, like it was no big deal, I went into the house. My mom was living at the time and was in the room closest to where all this happened. She didn't hear anybody say turn around now. Or my yell of stop. Nobody heard a thing. I didn't think anything of it until years later, when I suddenly remembered hearing, turn around now, and recalled all of it. None of it makes sense to me. I'm not deeply religious. I don't know why anyone or anything would care about me turning around or not or would want to warn me. But whatever this was, it happened.